When I was an undergrad in college and I started realizing the power of income producing assets and real estate, it's something that was very appealing to me. So while I was getting my degree, I went and got a real estate license. I didn't practice a lot. I thought right when I got out of college, that'd be one of my options. And when I looked around, I realized the, the structure of how the industry worked. And after four years of paying for college, I thought that that wasn't the right time. So then I went to go work for another company. Um, 15 years later, I found my way to an opportunity to work for one of the greatest moguls at Easton in the space and ended up working in the real estate business once finally. I worked at GE Capital. I started my career in Connecticut for a couple of years in the underwriting um, the portfolio collections group. I made my way to Atlanta for about a year and then I made my way back to our state office in Boca Raton, which is where I was for the last 12 years of my career. So it's not about enough housing, it's about the cost of living. So if you have foreign investors that are looking to deploy their capital outside of their mother country and they are artificially increasing the value of the home, not artificially, increasing the value of the properties, it's a lot more difficult for somebody who, who works at a, at a decent income level with a family to then acquire that same asset that a year before was 10, 15 percent less. And then when you start looking at the, the challenges in the banking industry, that as far as the liquidity that your average person can get, get those loans, mm -hmm. it becomes exponentially more difficult because a lot of the foreign buyers are paying cash. Mm -hmm. So cash is artificially inflating it, lending is becoming, is every day becoming more and more restrictive. Some banks are loosening up, but it's still challenging. So that, when you get caught in between those two, that's when folks are having a difficult time mm -hmm. finding, the, finding residential real estate. My greatest skill set that I have was built in the classroom. So I taught finance, I learned finance from a book in college and in grad school. I worked with CFOs of multi-billion dollar companies through most of my tenure at GE. To take that and then to turn around and to be able to talk to a college student who's a junior or senior who may very well not have any interest in finance but needs it as a prerequisite and to be able to teach them the basics of finance is a skill set that I never would have known that I, that I would have developed. It's one of the greatest things that I've done. Not only to be able to make an impact on their lives and to change, but I can now sp speak about finance through the entire spectrum from somebody who doesn't have any idea or any concept of finance to a CFO of a, multi of, of a Fortune 100 company and, and, and anyone in between. In 2009, I really th started looking around at my friends that I had graduated with and realizing that financial literacy is something that has been very much forgotten or not taught or discarded. And it was important to me that at that point, I thought right the junior, senior year of college when you maybe have had a credit card or two, hopefully you haven't made too many mistakes, that you were that much in debt. So you at least had a good basis of, of what I was going to talk about was a good level to really start teaching folks the basics of, of, of financial literacy and giving them the skill sets to not make the mistakes that a lot of us in the United States have made and been over levered too soon and be running against with a headwind the rest of your career or for a very long time. So we decided the first thing that we did with the foundation was to establish this um, web, web uh, um, excuse me, to establish a workshop called Mo Money Less Problems. And it basically taught the basics of credit, the difference between credit cards, right? A captive credit card such as a Gap or, or Home Depot card versus your Chases of the world. Starting for your retirement, we, we demonstrate, and it's very simple and very pictorial, but it shows if you start retiring, if you start putting more money when you're 25 versus 35, the millions of dollars that that represents when you're 65 years old, that, just that 10 year gap. We also talked a little bit about, about forbearance and a lot of these zero percent deals that have subsided in the last few years after some of the regula regulatory changes. Mm -hmm. So the whole purpose is to really give people a good platform in an hour on the basics of credit and so they understand it. Some of there were students there whose parents have been in finance their entire career who tried to no avail to teach their kids this and in an hour of sitting with me a lot of what their parents had told them just clicked. So that's one of the major things that, that we were doing with the foundation was teaching financial literacy. And we did that here at the University of Miami, at FIU. We did it a lot with the city year core. 
So the city your core is about 150, to, and today it's over 200 core members who've given a year of their time to teach, to help the educational system for a year. And through my, through Saifi Shouf, who's their executive director, we went ahead and made that part of their curriculum, is helping teach them that. So Lee 305 is a concept that my partner Saifi Shouf and myself came up with. We found ourselves very blessed and lucky to be in the room with a lot of the established leadership base in Miami. And what we kept on finding is that those other leaders that were young but had already arrived, not, not necessarily emerging leaders, but leaders who were one of our good friends, Jared Davis, co-managing partner of Greenberg Chorg, he's a, an established leader. He's not necessarily an emerging leader. So we had, like Saif, myself, a few other friends that were being invited to the table, and we knew a lot of other folks that were similar to us that weren't being a part of the conversation. And we really wanted to bridge the gap between the current leadership base and the leadership base that was younger to make sure that there weren't any gaps. Because what I've felt over the time is as one leadership base starts to retire or starts to, to, to move on, and the next one, we, don't ha we, we haven't had historically that institutional knowledge. In Miami, we have something great that anybody can t access anybody. In some of the other major cities, you kind of have your, your pecking order of how things happen. Here, we don't have that case. We're a very open city, as I said, entrepreneurial. But because of that, there isn't necessarily that, success, that leadership succession planning that, that other cities might have had. And we were trying to bridge that gap. One of the th first initiatives that we did was we created this thing called Tech Fight. Tech Fight was an entrepreneurial conference overlaid with a martial arts tournament. The year was 2012. The new eco entrepreneurial ecosystem was starting to take root. The Knight Foundation and Matt Hagman was doing great things to really kind of give it a boost. And we thought that we could take all of our resources and bring it to the table from Andre Gudger from the, um, from the Pentagon that came down to speak to a lot of the local entrepreneurs or some of the angel investors. And we thought we can put them all in the room together and have a very meaningful dialogue. Now, this is Miami, and we like to, to be different. We really like to show something. So we went ahead and overlaid it with the martial arts tournament. So in the middle of the tournament, you'd have dragon dancers coming in, or during lunch, it was capoeira dance. So we really we gave it that zeal. But here's the interesting part. It was fun and it was creative, but we still decided to, to take, at the core of it, an entrepreneurial mindset. So we created an app, for example, we, and that app was all social media driven. 